A cheaper tablet hybrid has surfaced. Facebook wants to recruit all the babies. And a giant yellow man is eating his way through your city streets. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 306 for Tuesday, March 31st, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Welcome back to Tech News Tonight. I am Megan Maroney. Let's get right to today's top story. This morning, Microsoft announced the Surface 3. It's a $499 tablet hybrid designed for the masses, especially those masses who love fancy colored keyboards. The Surface 3 comes with a 10.8-inch screen, 2 gigabytes of RAM, and 64 gigabytes of storage. Alex Wilhelm, writer at TechCrunch, had a chance to play with the new Surface 3 and joins us today to talk about it. Welcome, Alex. Hey, how's it going? Good. So how does the Surface 3 compare to the Surface Pro 3? If I just waved them in the air like this and didn't tell you which one was which, you probably couldn't tell. I mean, they're, they're very, very similar in terms of fit, finish, um, different processor, different size. But I mean, they're certainly very, very related. And I like the way the Pro 3 has looked uh, in its history. So I'm kind of a fan of the new Surface 3 aesthetic. So this is the first non-Pro Surface not running Windows RT, correct? Yes. What, what OS is it running? It's running Windows. I mean, it's running the same Windows 8.1 and later on Windows 10 that the Pro 3 runs. It's a full Windows laptop, just in a slightly smaller package. I mean, I think the problem with the Surface RT going all the way back to the start of the project was that Windows RT was very, very immature. And so the device itself wasn't that useful. And Microsoft kind of gave up on RT in the new Windows 10 project. So to see it go away in this, you know, version of Surface, it's not that surprising. Right. So what accessories does it come with and what doesn't it come with? It does not come with accessories. I'm welcome to buy more stuff. I mean, you have to have margin somewhere, right? So the uh, the Surface 3 does not come with a keyboard or a pen. They're the same price as they are for the Pro 3. Dock is the same price. So the same sort of peripheral lineup, but the actual core unit costs, I think, about 38% less. So the computer is cheaper. Everything else is, basically, is, is the same. But there's not a keyboard or a pen for the masses. You have to pay the well, same as everyone else. You have to pay for them, but yeah, they're out there. Right. So how much does it weigh? I mean, is it the size of an iPad? Is it heavier? It's about 1.36 pounds, and the Pro 3 is 1.76 pounds. If I have that correct, don't flame me in the comments. It's close enough. Um, so it's a bit lighter. But, I mean, at, at that point, do you really care about another couple of ounces? It doesn't weigh that much. iPads don't weigh that much. So I don't think people are going to notice either way. Right. So, I mean, do you think this is going to be a competitor to the iPad? I mean, it, is this – or is it a totally different user base? You know, there's been a lot of talk about them releasing a, uh, like an iPad Pro or an iPad device aimed at kind of business people that has pen capabilities and so forth. Um, that'd be a fun crossover. But I don't know if this is really aimed at the same demographics. I feel like Microsoft is going after the um, student crowd with this. It comes with Office for a year and that sort of thing. Uh, iPads are more for consumption, I feel. And I, they're great for that. But I don't know if it's the same overall idea or market placement as the, the three itself. So when they say this one is for families, it's really just for parents who want to buy their college or high school student uh, a working device. I mean, it's a great little computer. I haven't had a lot of hands-on time yet. I will later this week. But I, I, I mean, sure, if you want to stay on the Windows platform. But I, I don't know if I would really make it my daily user device because it's a little small on the screen. And, um, you know, it, it, it's a great idea, but I don't know if I'd make it my, my full-time main computer, personally. Right. So how does the pen work? Um, the pen works surprisingly well. Um, the pen input on all the service devices has been kind of a selling point since they came out. Um, and on the Pro 3, which is the most recent one to have this new pen uh, type, has done pretty well. And I think the 3 will kind of keep continue that. It's not really that different. And so it's not that I keep saying that, but like it's really the Pro 3, but just, you know, compacted down. Um, so if you've ever used a Pro 3 and the pen, you know what you're going to get it into, just with less space. Right. So this is a little bit smaller, a little bit cheaper, well, a, lot a, little cheaper. Bit, a lot cheaper, and a little bit slower or a lot slower? Um, I would say a little bit. We'll have to see. It's about 80% as fast as the Core i3 Pro 3. So I have the Core i5 Pro 3, so I can't really directly measure. But I mean, it's a you know, it has 10 hours of battery life. You're not going to have 
you know, a quad core gaming processor in there if you're going to have that kind of life. So it's a trade off battery life V power, but I think they made a good choice. After more testing, I can be more, more sure, but it felt good when I used it. Okay, so more Microsoft news. Yesterday, uh, they announced the newest build of Windows 10 that yes. includes the Spartan browser, and it's only for Windows insiders. Um, so the Spartan browser is going to replace Internet Explorer, or not exactly? How, how's that going to work? Yeah, there's a huge controversy about this. So IE is no longer their main browser. Spartan will be the browser going forward. But for legacy corporations like enterprises, you have to have IE support. So they'll keep developing IE. It'll ship with Windows 10. But it'll be in the background. You can turn it on, but it's on by default. So it's not dead, it's just not quite alive. It's kind of like Schrodinger's browser, if you will. And then you have to kind of like decide for yourself. But certainly it's not going to be gone entirely, but Spartan is the future. Right. So we know Spartan will include integration with Cortana, the digital assistant. Um, what else is it going to be able to do? It's really designed to handle the modern web as fast as possible. If you go back to when Chrome came out, it was a really lightweight, low bloat, fast browser. And in some ways, I feel like Microsoft is trying to kind of replicate that initial success with its own bells and whistles, like Cortana. Um, they've been talking about read mode, they've been talking about just other small things they've built in. I think that it's still premature to decide if we're going to use it because it's really, really, really early beta stuff. But I mean, I think impressions have been overall strong and the clean UI has been praised. But, you know, it's a long way from taking back market share from Chrome. So it's kind of a wait and see, but certainly a maybe optimistic one. Right, so it'll be faster, more reliable. Have they said anything about it being more secure than Internet Explorer? Yeah, I talked to the team about this, and I, I talked about security a little bit, and they kind of referred to it, I think, I believe it was table stakes, as in, like, you have to nail security. That can't be a selling point. It has to be just completely secure, and it has to protect all its users, or it doesn't mean anything. So I think they view security under the rubric of, like, if we don't get this right, we have no chance to win anywhere else. And so certainly it's a high priority for them. So do they expect to, um, are they still going to be updating Internet Explorer? Do you know? I mean, Yeah, I mean, they can't let it go because so many legacy corporations that are paying customers of the company depend on that to run legacy software. And so when you're that big of a corporation, you can't just cut something off and throw it away. You have to support it for years and years and years. So we'll see IE 11, maybe in IE 12. Um, but I mean, it's no longer the main focus. The company is certainly moving resources over to Spartan to make that its larger push. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, a lot of people hated Internet Explorer, including yeah, me. Yeah, mo mo most of them. Um, which is too bad because the team really over there got their stuff together towards the end and really made improvements. It was just too late. I mean, if they started that process back before they gave us IE 7, 8, and 9, you know, it may have been a little different, but it was just a little late. And I think they're doing the, I think the smart thing by cutting their losses and just moving on. I mean, could you really save that brand? Do you want to? Right. Uh, the answer is I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I know you said it's hard to tell, it's not finished, but I wonder if it really is too late, even for something new. I mean, I, I just wonder if people are really going to switch over from Chrome. Well, they have an advantage, though. It'll ship with Windows 10, and they're going to bring everyone from 7 and 8 to 10. So they have the potential, if it's very good, to get a lot of users on the upgrade cycle. If people say, this is better than Chrome, I'll use this instead of Chrome or instead of Firefox or you know, whatever you want to use, like Max Thought, whatever. Um, but I mean, you're right. I mean, they have a, certainly have a deficit to get through, but you can solve that with great products. And no matter how large you are, how bad your brand is in certain areas, if you build awesome stuff, people will use it. And so it's a quality game. If they can build something that good, they'll win. If they can't, well, it'll be about the same as where they are now. Right. It's interesting because, I mean, I don't think Safari is that great, but I don't see Apple rushing to replace it <laughs> with something better. I mean, Safari is terrible. iTunes, iTunes is the worst piece of software written for Windows, I think, ever. Um, but it doesn't matter because they just have a lock on that part of the market. Right. And we all use Spotify now anyway, so who really cares? <laughs> exactly. Except for if you want to listen to Taylor Swift. Right. And that's what we have YouTube. Thank you, Google. Right. So I want to move on to another story. It's been brewing over the past few weeks, ever since someone accidentally sent the Wall Street Journal an internal FTC report. Uh, yeah. The report implied that some members of the FTC wanted to bring an antitrust case against Google. This was back in uh, 2012. But they, they somehow were convinced not to bring that antitrust case. Now, last week, you covered Google's response to the Wall Street Journal's criticism of the yes. way Google influences politics. How did Google respond to these? Google was not really enthused. Actually, Google and the FTC both kind of fought back over this and were like, look, what are you trying to insinuate here? Um, first of all, going back to the accidental thing, the FTC appears to be very embarrassed having accidentally sent this out. Uh, initially, people in the media were like, look, there's no, this was an accident. This has to be, you know, planted. But there's been enough kind of backtracking and hemming and hawing. I wonder if it actually was a mistake. Um, but what, you, what you're seeing here is a really small fraction of the overall documentary process over the FTC. This is one subgroup of the FTC's partial and redacted points. Now, they were relatively strident, but this was the office that does 
kind of anti-competitive investigations, if I recall correctly. So the fact that they were worried about Google is not that surprising. But other parts of the FTC advocated against suing them or against further legal action, and that's kind of a one out in the five zero vote. Um, I don't think we have enough new stuff here to precisely pinpoint who was right and wrong, but I think that to call Google kind of a specter that haunts the U.S. government's a bit much. I mean, yes, Google is rich, but so is ExxonMobil. So, you know. Right. But then, I mean, the way Google responded was interesting. It was more to sh shoot back in like a journalistic way. You know, Wall Street Journal is yes. owned by Rupert Murdoch, by News Corp. You know, what what, what about your influence? It's, you know, just like it, it got yes. a bit childish. Well, there were gifts involved. I think this is the new, the new thing. I think large corporations are trying to use gifts to, uh, you know, make themselves seem a little more fun. As you can see on the screen now, there's a crying or laughing or sad or happy baby. I can't really tell. But there were a number of these. And they were trying to convey, I think, just derision and a complete lack of faith in the reporting that was going on because it was, in their view, and this is their view, not mine, it was slanted. And so they made a rumor Murdoch joke. They pushed back on a quote-by-quote -quote basis, trying to show that this is, you know, fatuous and, and incorrect. But, I mean, we usually didn't see that. Usually companies would respond with a, a no comment or a very bland comment, not a not a exculpatory blog post with gifts of children. I mean, it certainly had a different tone. There's the second one. And I, I wonder if they were just trying to be like, look, this is so stupid that we won't even deign to give it the usual response that we, that we do. So we're going to do this instead. And if that's the case, then, you know, go for it, Google. Have your fun. It's more <laughs> fun to laugh than to cry. I'll just say that. I guess so, yeah. I mean, it really just shows that Google is really in the, you know, that they're, they're you had a great line about, you know, they're old enough. They're a company old enough to buy cigarettes. They need to stop acting like this. Actually, no, I was informed by, by a commenter that they're, like, they're 16 and a half now, not 18. I'm uh -huh. sorry. I, I, I subtracted incorrectly in my head. So the joke kind of fell apart. And I appreciate the commenters for, uh, you know, keeping me honest. But yeah, I mean, they're an old corporation. I mean, Google is not new. They're, not, they're so, so not a startup. But to see spunk from that, I mean, this is a corporation that has people that help out with, you know, Obama science groups and so forth. They're a big damn deal. Right. And so it's fun to see them kind of stretch the legs a little bit. Right. Well, Alex, it is always a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank Alex you. is a writer at TechCrunch, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. I'll see you soon. Bye, guys. Take care. Coming up, Apple Pay disappoints, and Amazon has one button to solve all of your problems. But first, the elusive home-cooked meal. How do you do it and still relentlessly follow your Twitter feed all day? Have you tried Blue Apron yet? They make it possible to have a home-cooked meal that you cook even if you've worked all day, Blue Apron delivers fresh, ready-to-cook meals right to your door. For less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron sends you fresh, proportioned ingredients with step-by-step -step recipe instructions, including beautifully printed pictures. You can skip that trip to the grocery store and stop endlessly searching online for recipes with ingredients that you wouldn't know where to buy anyway. And how many bottles of sesame oil have you bought for one recipe that you never seem to find the chance to use again before they go bad? For me, the answer to that question is a lot. But Blue Apron gives you exactly what you need and nothing more. I like Blue Apron's family plan. They have kid-friendly ingredients and easy-to-follow instructions so everyone can pitch in. Each balanced meal is between 500 to 700 calories per serving. Cooking takes about a half an hour. Shipping is free, and the menus are always new. They won't send the same meal twice. Blue Apron works around your schedule and dietary preferences, and Blue Apron's experts source only the best seasonal ingredients for incredible meals like Navarin-style lamb meatball stew or roasted broccoli and fragola sarda salad. Blue Apron, it's a better way to cook. Check out this week's menu and try it yourself. You can get your first two meals free. Go to blueapron.com slash twit. Yes, you heard me right. Two free meals just for going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Tonight. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Facebook just made it easier to collect all your children's baby pictures into one place on Facebook. The new scrapbook feature announced today allows you to tag your child in photos to help you organize and share them, not only with your friends, but with the friends of your child's other parent, as long as you and that other parent are in a relationship on Facebook. Also, Facebook will automatically allow you to turn over this page to your child once they are 13 and old enough to be on Facebook. Now, am I the only cynical person who thinks this is a blatant ploy to introduce a new generation to Facebook? Also, as a parent of tweens, I will tell you that very few 13-year-olds appreciate having their parents populate their Facebook page with pictures of them in diapers. But if you're the parent of a baby, go for it. You have 13 years left before you have to seriously regret that decision. 
Bloomberg reports that Apple Pay might not be as successful as Tim Cook claims it has been. According to a survey by Phoenix Marketing International, Apple has created a, a demand that cannot be filled. Nearly 50% of Apple Pay users visited a store that was supposed to take Apple Pay, only to find that once they tried to pay, machines either weren't working or weren't ready yet. And another Apple News, Buster Hine from Cult of Mac reports that the U.S. Patent Office granted Apple a patent for a technology that would allow users to unlock a phone with facial recognition. That means that someday soon, iPhone users will be able to ditch Touch ID for a selfie. Now, Android phones already allow you to do this, but Google says their version of this technology is less secure than a password since it will work with someone who looks like you. Now, a few weeks ago, we also reported on Windows Hello, a similar feature that Microsoft claims will allow you to unlock Windows 10 with your face. I really want this next story to be an April Fool's joke, but apparently it is not. Today, Amazon announced the Dash button. It's a small adhesive button that connects to the Amazon app on your smartphone through your home Wi-Fi network. You tell it what to order once, and then whenever you run low, you just push the button to automatically reorder it. Now, this seems way easier than the conversation I had with my husband this morning about whether he was going to the grocery store and why I prefer liquid laundry detergent to the powder. Amazon already knows that about me. It doesn't have to ask why, so this is great. However, I do wonder if this dash button business is all a part of Amazon's secret plan to keep us locked in our houses all the time. Maybe they're using up all the fresh air out there or something. I don't know. Get out every once in a while. Now, in honor of April Fool's Day tomorrow or today, for those of you who are watching or listening to this later or in a different time zone, Google Maps will allow you to play Pac-Man on your city streets. Now, this is no joke, I know, because I spent an embarrassing amount of time playing Pac-Man around the streets of our office today, right from my desk, because given the chance to play Pac-Man, I will always, always take it. Also, Miss Pac-Man. Give it a try, people. I'm not sure how long this feature will be available. Thank you to everyone who's been tagging or sending selfies, watching or listening to Tech News Tonight. Today's TN2 Selfie Fan of the Day is Derek from Raleigh, North Carolina. He says he watches TN2 every morning while making lattes for his wife and himself. He also goes on to say, the show gives me a burst of energy to start the day. Or is that the espresso? I don't know. Maybe both. Thanks for watching the show, Derek. And thanks for sending in the selfie. And for the reminder that if you miss the show in the evening, you can watch it again right before you watch our morning news program by uh, going to our site at twit.tv. Tech News Today is our morning program. That's at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Send us your selfies. Tag your pictures with hashtag TN2Selfie on Twitter, Google+, Instagram, or via email to TN2 at twit.tv and tell us a little bit about yourself. We might choose to show your selfie on the show. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can su subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write to us at TN2 at twit.tv and watch us live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.